Hey, if you've got a Bible, take it and turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We, we finished the letter to the seven churches, and then we started chapter 4 last week, and I want to encourage you in something if you were not here or serving and unable to be in here, I really want to encourage you to go back and either listen slash watch last week's. And here's why. Chapters four and five is one section of the book of Revelation. They never really, you know, when John wrote this, he didn't write, you know, chapter five, number one, number two. Number, it, th- those things were added later. It doesn't make them wrong. They're actually extremely helpful. However, it is still one section. So I'd want to encourage you, go back, and if you didn't, check out chapter four because it is a part of one section. And it's not only one section, but it is, the, it is what we call the interpretive key to the whole book of Revelation. If you want to understand what Revelation is about, you have to understand chapters four and chapters five. Because there are two images that are used in these two chapters. I've already mentioned this. This is recap. Two images mentioned in chapters 4 and then also in chapters 5, and they are used all over the book of Revelation, over 40 times for the throne of God and over 25 times for the Lamb of God. Those are the two images that are unquestionably the key to understanding the book of Revelation. That is that there is a throne in heaven where God dwells, and there is a Lamb who was crucified for the sins of the world. And where we left off in chapter 4 was that John is before the throne of God where all the angels and the redeemed people of God are worshiping. The angels begin worship with holy, 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 and then all of God's redeemed people get off of their thrones and they cast down their crowns before the Lord in worship. And that's where we left off. Now, John was just kept writing, so we'll just keep talking about it. Chapter 5, verse 1. And then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? All over the Bible, this phrase, the right hand of God, is used. And it always speaks of the favor of God, the power of God, the authority of God. In fact, sometimes, I won't be referencing those, but sometimes even Jesus himself is referred to as the right hand of God. But usually the right hand speaks of favor and power. I'll throw a couple verses up here. Let me read this to you. Psalm 16, verse 11. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forever. Isaiah 41.10, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be anxious about you for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We also get the idea in scripture that whatever is in God's hand is totally safe. John chapter 10 verse 27, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Neither will anyone snatch them out of my hand. So the hands of God are like those safe, when the Bible talks about being in the hand of God, it's talking about you are safe, you are secure, no one could remove you from his presence. And if we put all this imagery together, we remind ourselves that John tells us he was caught up in the spirit, don't know exactly what that means, Was his body laying somewhere and his spirit was up there? Did his whole body go up there? Was it just a dream that happened so quickly that in between blinks everything that we read about happened? We have no idea. But we know somehow these events happened and John was caught up into the throne room of God in heaven and and it says that he saw one who sat on the throne. It's really significant. John never says, I saw God sitting on the throne. He says, I saw one sitting on the throne. He never says, I saw God sitting on the throne. Now, am I suggesting it wasn't God on the throne? Of course not. It was definitely God who was sitting on the throne. However, the attention in Revelation 5 is going to move away from the one sitting on the throne to the one who is able to take the scroll and open it. So the movement, so like if, if, if John said, hey, I saw God sitting on the throne, now all we want to know is, wait, tell us all about God. 
So John's like, I'm not going to get into that right now. I saw one sitting on the throne, but he focuses in on this scroll. And the scroll would have been considered very unique. When, when people read this, this letter from John, they would have been like, whoa, this scroll is important. And it is rich with meaning and words. It was a scroll written on the inside and the outside. So when you rolled it up, it had writing on the inside rolling and on the outside. It was filled with words, which is unusual. And everybody reading this letter would have been like, wow, what kind of scroll is this? This is weird. This is different. And we're never told exactly what was written on the scroll. Isn't that frustrating? We never have a verse that says, by the way, here's what was on the scroll. So we have to somewhat use our deduction, and it's not very difficult to figure out and to deduce what was written on there. Let me read verse 3 and 4, and then we'll, 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 we'll get to there, okay? Uh, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So, John writes, I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it. It's an incredibly, listen, let me, it's hard to imagine this, but we're like information people, right? We live in the information age. We're so into information that you have to imagine that when John wrote all these things, people's first idea was not, what's the information? It was, oh, wow, this is dramatic. Their minds were drawn to the drama of what's happening, not just tell me the information. So what was really happening? Was there in heaven... And the one who's sitting on the throne is holding a scroll in his hand. A scroll sealed with seven wire and seven seals. Seven ropes, seven seals. Written on the inside and the outside. All of heaven has been worshiping. Holy, holy, holy. Worthy are you, Lord. And then a strong angel stands and says, Who is able to open the seal or the scroll and the seals thereof? And John begins to look around. And this becomes... Like, this is the moment of heaven. Whatever else was happening, everything paused. All worship, all conversation, all side conversation, everything paused. And no one was worthy to open the scroll. And what you have to see is, like, I think sometimes, you know, we, 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 we think of the Bible kind of like the way we see, like, a movie. Like, it's already been scripted, so it's already known. Try to imagine this from John's perspective. Try to imagine this like, if I were to read to you the faithfulness of God all morning, if I spent all morning read to you story after story of the faithfulness of God, I guarantee you, every one of us in this room would be like, yes, God is so faithful, God is so faithful, and I promise you that sometime this week you will doubt the faithfulness of God because of situations in your own life. It's just who we are, I'm not blaming you. I'm just saying that's the reality. We can read all about the faithfulness of God. Oh man, God is so strong. In fact, if you come to me and say, can you pray for me for this thing? I have full confidence for your life. But we tend to doubt it for our own life, don't we? So imagine this. John is in heaven and, the, and he hears this angel saying, who can open the scroll? And he starts to weep. Not shed a tear, but convulse. And it's not the kind of convulsing of, oh no, it's this shaking convulsing of like, this, is, this will be the great tragedy of human history. He's shaking and he's crying and he's weeping. And so the theme here is not what's written on it. Now, by the way, I'll give you the best sense that I don't, not many people would really doubt, but the best sense of what was written on there. But before that, because we just want information. The problem is this. If we don't understand the drama of what's happening, you won't understand its value. The value was not simply what was written, but what was happening when these things were occurring. It's far more important. Now, what we do know is that in John's day and in the, in the Roman world, they were all in Roman wills, Roman testaments were always, guess what, sealed, guess how many times? Seven times. So we can deduce very quickly, what is it that was written on this scroll? This would be the last will and testament of human history from God's perspective. God is laying out what's about to happen. Who, what, when, where, why, everything. And John's convulsing with tears is because he's like, here I am caught up into heaven. There's God, there's angels, there's the world rejoicing. But nobody is able to finish this. And it, and it really struck him. And so 
the angel, nobody is able, you know, who is able to open the seal? And then verse 5, but one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. Very cool, right? That's what would have happened if this was a movie. This was the moment when we'd all go, woo! Because there's like, there's hope. And this is so rich with like, this is like a, you know, Braveheart moment. This is one of those, you know, this is deep. This is real. Some, okay, yeah. Um, it seems that heaven already knew the answer, but John did not. You ever felt that way? I know what the Bible says about Jesus, and then my immediate experience isn't the same. I know that God is victorious and knows all things, but somehow it doesn't seem to help me at certain moments. And I'm certain that's not God's fault. Maybe you know God is powerful, but it's more theoretical. John has been living, like, remember, this is like, you know, 80, 90 AD. John has been experiencing the power of God in his life and his ministry for decades. He's arguably spent six decades being faithful to God. But now here he is, he's transported to the throne of God, and all of human history is present, and he feels the weight of eternity. And one of the elders... By the way, you remember what we talked about, the elders? And we'll, we'll see it again in just a couple verses, but I already told you this last week. The 24 elders are all of the redeemed people of God in all of human history. How do I know that? Based on the verses 9 and 10, what we're going to see in just a minute. Where the elders are the ones that are rejoicing and they're worshiping. You are the one that has redeemed us from all nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues. Well, who is he talking about? That's all of human history. All the different peoples from all over the world in all of history. And so that means, so listen to this. John the Apostle, the writer of a gospel, three letters, and the apocalypse, the revelation. I think we could argue that at this moment in human history, let's say it's 90 AD, I'm picking a date just for the sake of, of, of argument. In 90 AD, I think we could argue this without it being an argument. There is no one on planet Earth who knew Jesus better than the Apostle John. No one. This is the man who in the Gospel of John, it says that he was leaning against Jesus. That just means he knew how close he was to Jesus. And then imagine this whole scene that we just read about in Revelation 5 starts happening. And John is weeping. And I want you to imagine this. You ready? This is, I can't prove this, but I want you to imagine it. Because the 24 elders are all the redeemed people of God in all of human history. So I want you to imagine John is weeping. And a 14-year-old from 2023 walks up to John. A 14-year-old. An 8th grader in middle school walks up to John. And says, don't weep. For the lion of the tribe of Judah, what's the verse? Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. Or some beautiful Nigerian woman from 1820 who lived in Lagos, Nigeria, who got saved through testimony after testimony after testimony, will never see a written document of Jesus but heard the gospel and believed. And she is the one. She is one of the elders of the 24 because they represent all of human history. Imagine she walks up to the apostle John and says, you can stop crying because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. Do you see? It reminds me that the person with the greatest power and peace is the one who knows their God. Not the one with the pedigree or degree or experience. John had more pedigree, more degree, and more experience than anybody on the planet. But in heaven, they knew God. And that eighth grader in middle school who was caught up, you know, who, or, who went to be with the Lord and is now there rejoicing, they're able to look at the, the smartest, the wisest Christian today and they can say, don't weep because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. By the way, he's referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. This is, this is the introduction. It's a great introduction. You ever watch like a boxing match and they say, you know, Muhammad Ali had all those names for who he was. He's this and he's that. And he, he gave all of his own names, you know. But he's this and he's that. And then he earned them. He beat everybody. He earned it. But he, I'm this and I'm that and I'm great and I'm so powerful and I'm so this and I'm so that. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. What a name. And so John, ready? Look at verse 6 with me. I looked... And behold, 
In the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Don't get caught up in seven horns and seven eyes. Remember, these guys didn't write, they weren't journalists writing an article for a blog post of fact. They were imagining for people so that, because you wouldn't get to read that later. You wouldn't have a copy of this for yourself. So John uses this great imagery to make it stick in your head. Seven horns, all power. Seven eyes, all wisdom, all knowledge, all sight, all vision. It was meant to evoke something to you. I want to read a quote to you from Michael Gorman on this point. It's important. It'll be on the screens, I believe. Here we go. Both John and we as readers are awaiting the unveiling and the identification of this powerful, conquering, messianic lion. Perhaps both John and we suspect that the elder is directing our attention to Jesus, the Lion of Judah and the Son of David, and he is. But in perhaps the most mind-wrenching rebirth of images in all of literature, the vision John receives and describes is not what anyone would have expected. It's the vision of a slaughtered lamb, not a ferocious lion. The shock of this reversal, writes Hayes, discloses the central mystery of all revelation. God overcomes the world not through a show of force, but through the suffering and death of Jesus, the faithful witness. I want to, I want to quote that one again. God overcomes the world not through a show of force, but through the suffering and death of Jesus, the faithful witness. Imagine, imagine the boxers coming out with all the big names. He's this and he's that and he's this and he's that. And then out walks this person who's already been beaten, already been abused, already been slaughtered, already been murdered. What a shock this, to the system this was to the Apostle John. Here's this, you know, my analogy. is this 14-year-old saying, don't cry, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And I looked and what did I see? But a lamb who has been slaughtered before the foundation of the world. What a powerful image this is meant to be for all the rest of our lives. It should recenter our entire way of thinking. We will no longer draw the conclusion that once we suffer, then we will be in glory. We have got to displace this, 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 this false dichotomy that it's cross to crown. It is not cross to crown. It is cross and crown. You will not suffer today, in that, but that one day everything will be really great. But that it is through the perpetual death of our Savior that you and I will ever have eternal life. We will forever be linked to cross and crown. It's why we are so quick to push off our crowns, right? Fishermen's casting, you cast a line. It's the same way they cast their crowns. They don't just gently place and say, it's my precious, I'll see you in a minute. They cast off their crowns. They throw off their crowns. In the same way, we will always be identified as the people of cross and crown for all of eternity. But I want so badly to believe I want so badly to believe. I want to believe this is, don't you want to believe this, parents? If things are bad now, it'll definitely get better because I'm a Christian. Don't we want to believe this in our jobs? If it's bad now, it has to get better. God owes me is never said but always felt. Then again, I have to remind myself that if God himself does not move from cross to crown, but instead from cross and crown, why would that be any different for me? That's not fatalism. I'm not a fatalist. But it humbles me. It actually protects me from fatalism where everything is about my humiliation. There are Christians like that. Hey, everything is bad. Everything, you know, the world is bad. Everything is bad. We're all, you know, but hey, just hold out and hide out and one day Jesus will come back. That's a fatalism that is not taught in the Bible. The very idea that the world would be Going down is the very reason we're meant to be out there to be the light of the world. It's not the opposite. It wasn't like the world was awesome, so we should go out and frolic in the garden and have fun. It's the world is declining and dying, and this is our moment to shine brightest. Because let's be honest. 
We're not that bright of a light. <laughs> now, if you felt I was looking at you, I was, okay? <laughs> Look at it, all of us. We aren't that bright of a light. I mean, you know, arguably, without argument, there are some believers in parts of the world that they're shining so bright. They're shining, and I'm not, I'm not putting any of us down. I'm just saying, you know, maybe our light isn't that bright, but, and yet, and then when things get a little darker, we push against that. It's so ironic. Because when things are dark, even dim lights shine. This is our moment. We've never had a greater moment, and yet we're, 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 we're constantly, you know, we have this fatalistic approach to life. I don't believe in false optimism, but I believe the Bible's answer to false optimism is biblical hope. That at the very worst moment that I will ever have here on earth, I will one day see God. And until then, I will be held in his arms. I will be held in his strong right hand. No matter what, no matter what cross I will bear and you will bear. You know, we love to magnify. You better pick up your cross. This is the time. That's a fatalistic approach. To pick up your cross just means to move on with the struggles and difficulties of life and believe that there will be crown. And to not give up hope. To not be fatalistic. But I can no longer, you know, what really creates fatalism in my heart is when I believe, okay, I just got to suffer today, but tomorrow will be better. Friends, I don't mean this to discourage you at all. I mean this to give you hope. It's kind of backwards hope, isn't it? It's to say this, that even if tomorrow is not better, God loves you. And he's for you. And he is still on the throne and even if that sickness is still there, even if that child that has walked away from God is still in that situation, all is not lost. Because there is cross and crown. Stop waiting for the cross to disappear before you can enjoy any victories in Christ. You are meant to have both. It sucks. It's awesome. Can I say that? <laughs> I think we have to hear that, right? Yeah. Because we're waiting. We're like, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'm telling you right now, the world will never give you a better tomorrow. But Jesus will. But forget tomorrow. He wants it to be a better today. To look at the situation and say, my God is on the throne. And he's not just on the throne, but I'm carrying a cross. He will forever be marked by the marks of a cross. I, I don't know exactly what that means. I'll be honest with you. It's not very clear exactly. Does that really mean forever and ever? We're not really sure if I could tell you that. But I do know this, when we get there, it's what we will see. Verse 7, and he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of, of, of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of, full of, bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9, and they sang a new song. Here's how I know the 24 elders are all the redeemed of God. You ready? Here's the song they sing. You are worthy to take this scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, people, nation. And you've made us kings and priests to our God. And we will reign on the earth. When Jesus takes the scroll, this is so dramatic. It's so cool. It's so like he takes the scroll and an explosion of worship happens all across heaven. A kind of explosion of worship where they begin to sing a new song. And what it means, you know, very few times in the Bible we read about a new song. It's not about like, oh wow, I've never heard this one before, how fun. It's not the new lyrical song. It's the new fresh expression of the redemption of God that I shout out in reaction to him in that moment. It's the same things over and over and over experienced fresh in my heart and in my life right at that moment. It's when we sing, I love you, Lord, at the end of our worship time, and it's a new song. Or it was like, oh, I know this one. Did you, do you see how that works? Every element of worship is either, oh, yeah, I know that song. Or I am going to sing this new from my heart. There will never be, a, listen, we're going to be in heaven for eternity. At some point, we're going to be like, I've heard that before. <laughs> and yet somehow we're not ever going to say, I've heard that before. 
How is that possible? Because we will constantly, and Ephesians tells us, we will be in the ages to come learning of the kindness of God. You're never going to get bored of God. You're going to be like, oh, those, those four chords together, I've heard that. But if that's what you hear in worship, then you have not yet heard worship, you've heard chords. A new song is not the, is not the rhythm of the song, the melody of the song, it is the reaction, the explosion of God's people in worship to God in a fresh and a new way. And we're reminded of the absolute faithfulness of God to reach people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. As a lifelong missionary, I have, Joy and I have, it does, this isn't a better or worse thing, but for us, with that calling, we have felt the burden of salvation for people around the world in ways that I cannot tell you what this passage means to us. It is the fulfillment of our life's purpose to know that when you are out there at the ends of the earth trying to reach people, rejected upon rejected upon rejected upon rejected, and when four people gather together, you feel like revival broke out, to know that one day people from every tribe Every tongue, every nation, and every people will be present before the throne of God. All I ever, when I first became a Christian, all I ever wanted to do was to get to share the gospel with as many Russian people as I could. That was my first place. And then ultimately, Hungary became that place. And when you leave, like for us, when we left Hungary, Eastern Europe, Russia, that whole sphere, there's really only one question that you keep asking yourself. <coughs> excuse me, over and over and over. And it's this, did we do enough? And you can justify and feel like, ah, oh, we did, I think we did, and then, but some days you have a lousy day and you're like, I don't think we did. And then, and I guarantee you, when, when, my, when I'm done, when God says, you're finished at, in San Diego, I'm gonna wonder, did I do enough? Unless I've been raptured or dead at that point, I won't wonder at that matter. But in any other way, it's what you do, you wonder did I do? And it's not a savior complex, it's a stewardship complex. I want to clarify, it's an important difference. Savior complex says, I should have done, I could have done better. Steward complex says, I, I hope, Lord, that I gave everything that you gave to me. I want to have been faithful with what I have. I want to be a faithful steward. Friends, I, I think that we've been put in South Bay, San Diego for this season. Season doesn't mean like fall, it just means this part of our life to be faithful stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ without pretense or pretension in any ways so that people could hear who the real Jesus is. And if they're hung up on things, we bypass those problems in order to find a way to connect to human beings. We care nothing about the trite, temporary issues that people are caught up in. We push right through them because there is an eternal issue at stake. Oh, I am into this. Cool. Cool. You want to talk? I feel this way. Awesome. Let's talk. We let nothing get in our way. We have but one mission. And that mission is not to go running around trying to hand out as many cards as you can to tell people about Jesus. It's to live out the gospel in every possible way within your life. That's it. And then when God opens a door, you walk through the door. That's, that's what, in the, in the book of Acts, that's how the Bible describes boldness. It's not running around standing up on tables and saying, you are all going to hell. That's not boldness, it's rude. Seriously. Boldness is in every time God opens a door for you, you do not hesitate but walk into it. So when you get that, when that neighbor brings, you know, when you, you, know, you have a new neighbor and you're like, hey, I'm going to make something for them, I'm going I'm to step into that. I'm going to step into that not just by giving them some, a plate of cookies, but I'm going to share with them. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be bold. Verse 11. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom, strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and as such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard them saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. 
And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down, <coughs> excuse me, and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Next week, we're going to talk about the, we're going to look a little deeper at, the, at Revelation 4 and 5 as a combined idea now that we've been able to go through both of them. We'll get a little bit more into that. But it shouldn't surprise you in any way, and I'll talk more about this next week, that some of the greatest hymns, hymns are old worship songs, <laughs> and new worship songs, praise songs or whatever, it shouldn't surprise you that Revelation chapter 4 and 5 are where the largest amount of songs that have ever been written about God or to God or for God, they come out of these two chapters. Some of the greatest, I mean, you think of Handel's Messiah, it's from right here. And we'll talk more about that and I'll explain what that looks like in just a little bit. But kind of to wrap up fairly soon, in fact, I'll invite the worship team to come up. Come on up, guys, gals. And I think we're going to hand out the elements of communion soon. I think. I don't remember. I think we are. We'll see. No, we're not. Okay. <laughs> no worries. But I'll invite the worship team to come up and then I'll, but I've got a few more things, so they'll just be, they'll be up here. It'll be good. It shouldn't surprise you that Revelation 4 and 5 are so critical to understanding the whole letter of Revelation. I want you to see what honor is ascribed to Jesus as the lamb who was slain and the one who has the power to save. And I think we forget this. I I need you to understand this. Heaven is not escapism from reality. It is God's fulfilled vision for his redeemed people. In heaven, we are not escaping If we were escaping, we would never see a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. If if heaven was escapism, we would just focus on all the good things. And quite often, that's all we're all looking for in life. I don't want to deal with, I don't want to be healed from all the hardships. I want to avoid all the hardships. Amen? Can we just bypass all of that? But that's not heaven. Because heaven is where full and complete surgery has occurred upon our souls. And we are and will forever be healed. You won't be like, so, you know, I I do this uh, radio show called Pastor's Perspective and and inevitably within a a one month span, somebody will call and ask us, will I I know my family, will I know my friends in heaven? And then of course, conversely, the question is, will I know those people who are not here? And, And of course, the, the first thing that everybody wants to say is, you know, like, that's a hard one. Like, oh my gosh. Am I, how could it be heaven if I know that somebody that I love is not there? Well, the answer to that is this. First of all, yes, you will know even as you are known. And you will worship a righteous and faithful God who was righteous and faithful in every single person's life. Heaven is not escapism. You will face the full brunt with God in you and upon you and right next to you. You will face his peace through the most difficult, hell-wrenching situations of your life and you will be healed. You will be healed. The person that hurts you, you will be healed. That situation that caused you so much grief here on earth you will be healed. It will not be escapism. We're not going to get, it's not vacation from the horrors of earth. It is the full and total healing of every pain and every sorrow. Heaven is worshiping an almighty God who heals. We are acknowledging in paradise that glory of God's salvation came through sacrifice. Not crown, but cross and crown. Could you imagine that? That for all of eternity, we will work through, walk through, bear with some kind of delight and joy. All the hurts will be, we will just be being healed for all of eternity somehow. That thing that you forgot about. You know, that's the worst, right? You ever been like, you go to a family event, you know, and you kind of, you haven't been around your family for a while and you're around your family and then somebody brings up something that happened. You're like, oh, thanks. I moved on from that, right? That's what most of us just want to do. Lord, may I move on. 
And then we think we're healed. And then what happens is that when we get that brought up again, we got bitterness and anger again. Am I preaching to anybody on this? And then all of a sudden, you go, you go, here's the good Christian reaction. Oh man, I must not be a very forgiving person. I still haven't forgiven them. No, 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 no. It's just that you've been, a long to, you've been allowed to kind of move on. It's not that you didn't forgive. It's that it's being brought up. It's like a fresh cut in the same spot. And it makes you go, ow! That hurts. It's normal. But imagine in heaven, because let me just tell you, here on earth, these wounds... We've all got our battle scars, physical and emotional. They do not fully heal here on earth. God bless you. Have a, no, that's terrible. That's cross. But it's cross and crown. Because right now, when I get hurt and it reimagines all those pains again, I get a fresh opportunity to go to the cross and experience the grace and mercies of God. And I'll probably have that happen for the rest of my life here on earth. And then I'll get to heaven and there will be surgery done. It's band-aid today, it'll be surgery then. And you're like, uh, that sounds terrible. I thought I was just going to be singing and playing a harp. Who wants to play a harp? Nobody. Nobody wants to play a harp. It's not even the right translation, by the way. But anyways, beside the point. Harps? Okay, yeah, so we'll stop there. I was going to say they're in hell. But anyways, that's not, okay, that's not, that's rude because they can sound great, but you know. But imagine that you will be walked through full, the full surgery of healing in the presence of God. And it will be the fullness of joy. This is cross and this is crown. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.